Hello, everybody. I'm Jimena Triana. I'll be reading chapters 62 and 63 of the Ichabod today. Let's share the screen. I hope you enjoy it. Chapter 62, The Bonding. And now several things happened at almost the same time, so nobody watching could possibly keep up. But luckily, I can tell you about all of them. Lord Flapoon's bullet went flying towards the Ichabog's opening belly. Both Bert and Roderick, who'd sworn to protect the Ichabog no matter what, flung themselves into the path of that bullet, which hit Bert squarely in the chest. And as he fell to the ground, his wooden sign bearing the message that Ichabog is harmless shattered into splinters. Then, a baby Ichabog, which was already taller than a horse, came struggling out of its Icar's belly. Its bonding had been a dreadful one because it had come into the world full of its parents' fear of the gun, and the first thing it had ever seen was an attempt to kill it, so it sprinted straight at Flapoon, who was trying to reload. The soldiers, who might have helped Flapoon, were so terrified of the new monster bearing down upon them that they galloped out of its path without even trying to fire. Spittleworth was one of those who rode away fastest, and he was soon lost to sight. The baby Ichabog let out a terrible roar that still haunts the nightmares of those who witnessed the scene before launching itself at Flapoon. Within seconds, Flapoon lay dead upon the ground. All of this happened very fast. People were screaming and crying, and Daisy was still holding on to the dying Ichabog, which lay on the road beside Bert. Roderick and Martha were bending over Bert, who to their amazement had opened his eyes. I, I think I'm all right, he whispered, and feeling beneath his shirt, he pulled out his father's huge silver medal. Flapoon's bullet was buried in it. The medal had saved Bert's life. Seeing that Bird was alive, Daisy now buried her hands in the hair on either side of the Ichabog's face again. I didn't see, I didn't see my Ichaboggle, whispered the dying Ichabog, in whose eyes there were again tears like glass apples. It's beautiful, said Daisy, who was also starting to cry. Cry. Look, here. A second Ichaboggle was wriggling out of the Ichabog's tummy. This one had a friendly face and wore a timid smile because its bonding had happened as its parent was looking into Daisy's face and had seen her tears and understood that a human could love an Ichabog as though it was one of their own family. Ignoring the noise and clamor all around it, the second Ichabog knelt beside Daisy in the road and stroked the big Ichabog's face. Icar and Ichabog looked at each other and smiled. And then the big Ichabog's eyes gently closed, and Daisy knew that it was dead. She buried her face in its shaggy hair and sobbed. You mustn't be sad, said a familiar booming voice as something stroked her hair. Don't cry, Daisy. This is the bonding. It's a glorious thing. Blinking, Daisy looked up at the baby, which was speaking with exactly the voice of its Icar. You know my name, she said. Well, of course I do, said the Ichabogle kindly. I was born dead knowing all about you, and now we must find my Ichabog, which Daisy understood was what Ichabogs called their siblings. Daisy stood up and saw Flapoon lying dead in the road and the firstborn Ichabogle surrounded by people holding pitchforks and guns. Climb up here with me, said Daisy urgently to the second baby, and hand in hand, the two of them mounted the wagon. Daisy shouted at the crowd to listen. As she was the one, as she was the girl who'd ridden through the country on the shoulder of the Ichabog, the nearest people guessed that she might know things worth hearing. So they shushed everyone else. And at last Daisy was able to speak. You mustn't hurt the Ichabogs, were the first word out of her words out of her mouth, when at last the crowd was silent. If you're cruel to them, they'll have babies who are born even crueler. Born dead cruel, corrected the Ichaboggle beside her. Born dead cruel, yes, said Daisy. But if they're born dead in kindness, they will be kind. They eat only mushrooms and they want to be our friends. The crowd muttered, uncertain, until Daisy explained about Major Beamish's death on the marsh and how he'd been shot by Lord Flapoon 
not killed by an Ichabod, and that Spittleworth had used the death to invent a story of a murderous monster in the, on the marsh. Then the crowd decided that they wanted to go and talk to King Fred. So the bodies of the dead Ichabod and Lord Flapoon were loaded onto the wagon, and 20 strong men pulled it along. Then the whole procession set off for the palace with Daisy, Martha, and the kind Ichabogle arm in arm at the front, and 30 citizens with guns surrounding the first, the fierce firstborn Ichabogle, which otherwise would have killed more humans because it had been born dead, fearing and hating them. But after a quick discussion, Bert and Roderick vanished, and where they went, you'll soon, you'll find out soon. Chapter 63, Lord Spittleworth's Last Plan. When Daisy entered the palace courtyard at the head of the people's procession, she was amazed to see how little it had altered. Fountains still played and peacocks still strutted, and the only change to the front of the palace was a single broken window up on the second floor. Then the great golden doors were flung open and the crowd saw two ragged people walking out to meet them a white-haired man holding an ax and a woman clutching an enormous saucepan. And Daisy, staring at the white-haired man, felt her knees buckle, and the kind Ica Boggle caught her and held her up. Mr. Dovetail tottered forward, and I don't think he even noticed that an actual live Ica Bug was standing beside his long-lost daughter. As the two of them hugged and sobbed, Daisy spotted Mrs. Bimish over her father's shoulder. Bert's alive, she called out to the pastry chef who was looking frantically for her son, but he had something to do. He'll be back soon. More prisoners now came hurrying out of the place and there were screams of joy as loved ones found loved ones and many of the orphanage children found their parents, found the parents they thought were dead. Then a lot of other things happened like the 30 strong men who surrounded the fierce Ichabogle, dragging it away before it could kill anyone else, and Daisy asking Mr. Dovetail if Martha could come and live with them, and Captain Goodfellow appearing on a balcony with a weeping King Fred, who was still wearing his pajamas and the crowd cheering when Captain Goodfellow said that he thought it was time to try to live without a king. However, we must now live this happy scene and track down the man who was most to blame for the terrible things that had happened to Cornucopia. Lord Spittleworth was miles away, galloping down a deserted country road when his horse suddenly went lame. When Spittleworth tried to force it onwards, the poor horse, which had had quite enough of being mistreated, reared and deposited Spittleworth onto the ground. When Spittleworth tried to whip it, the horse kicked him, then trotted away into a forest where, I'm pleased to tell you, it was later found by a kind farmer who nursed it back to health. Lord Spittleworth was therefore left to jog alone down the country lanes towards his country state, holding up his chief advisor's robes, lest he trip over them, and looking over his shoulder every few yards for fear that he was being followed. He knew perfectly well that his life in Cornucopia was over, that he still had that mountain of gold hidden in his wine cellar, and he intended to load up his carriage with as many ducats as he would fit, then sneak over to the border into Pluritania. Night had fallen by the time Spittleworth reached his mansion, and his feet were terribly sore. Hobbling inside, he bellowed for his butler, Scrumble, who so long ago had pretended to be Navi Baden's mother and Professor Frodisham. Down here, my lord, called a voice from the cellar. Why haven't you lit the lamps, Scrumble? Below Spittleworth, feeling his way, feeling his way downstairs. Thought it was best not to look like anyone was home, sir, called Scrumble. Ah, said Spittleworth, wincing his limped down, wincing as he limped downstairs. So you've heard, have you? Yes, sir, said the echoing voice. I imagine you'd be wanting to clear out, my lord. Yes, Scrumble, said Lord Spittleworth, limping towards the distant light of a single candle. I most certainly do. He pushed open the door to the cellar where he had been storing his gold all these years. The butler, whom Spittleworth could only make out dimly in the candlelight, was once wearing Professor Frodisham's costume. 
the white wig and the thick glasses that shrank his eyes to almost nothing. Thought it might be best if we travel in disguise, sir, said Scrumble, holding up old Widow Button's black dress and ginger wig. Good idea, said Spittleworth, hastily pulling off his robes and pulling on the costume. Do you have a cold, Scrumble? Your voice sounds strange. It's just the dust down here, sir, said the butler, moving further from the candlelight. And what will your lordship be wanting to do with Lady Islanda? She's still locked in the library. Leave her, said Spittleworth, after a moment's consideration, and serve her right for not marrying me when she had the chance. Very good, my lord. I've loaded up the carriage and couple of horses with most of the gold. Perhaps your lordship could help carry this last trunk? I hope you weren't thinking of living without me, Scrumble, said Spittleworth suspiciously, wondering whether if he'd arrived 10 minutes later, he might have found Scrumble gone. Oh no, my lord, Scrumble assured him. I wouldn't dream of living without your lordship. Withers the groom will be driving us, sir. He's ready and waiting in the courtyard. Excellent, said Spittleworth, and together they heaved the last trunk of gold upstairs through the deserted house and out into the courtyard behind where Spittleworth's carriage stood waiting in the darkness. Even the horses had sacks of gold slung over their backs. More gold had been strapped onto the top of the carriage in cases. As he and Scramble heaved the last trunk onto the roof, Spittleworth said, What is that peculiar noise? I hear nothing, my lord, said Scramble. It's an odd sort of grunting, said Spittleworth. A memory came back to Spittleworth as he stood here in the dark. That of standing in the icy white fog on the marsh all those years before and the whimpers of the dog struggling against the brambles in which it was tangled. This was a similar noise, as though some creature were trapped and unable to free itself, and it made Lord Spittleworth quite as nervous as it had the last time. Of course, it had been followed by Flathun, firing his blunderous and, start, and starting both of them onto the path to riches and the country down to the ruin. Scrumble, I don't like that noise. I don't expect you do, my lord. The, mon, the moon slid out from behind a cloud and Lord Spittleworth, turning quickly towards his butlers, whose voice sounded very different all of a sudden, found himself staring down the barrel of one of his own guns. Scramble had removed Professor, Professor Fodisham's wig and glasses to reveal that he wasn't the butler at all, but Bert Beamish. And for just a moment, seen by the moonlight, the boy looked so like his father that Spittleworth had the crazed notion that Major Beamish had risen from the dead to punish him. Then he looked wildly around him and saw, through the open door of the carriage, the real scramble, whacked and tied up on the floor, which was where the odd whimpering was coming from. And Lady Slanda sitting there, smiling and holding a second gun, opening his mouth to ask Withers, the groom, why he didn't do something, Spittleworth realized that this wasn't Withers, but Roderick Roach. When he'd spotted the two boys galloping up the drive, the real groom had quite rightly sensed trouble and stealing his favorite of Lord Spittleworth's horses had ridden off into the night. How did you get here so fast? Was all Spittleworth could think to say. We borrowed some horses from a farmer, said Bert. In fact, Bert and Roderick were much better riders than Spittleworth, so their horses hadn't gone lame. They'd managed to overtake him and had arrived in plenty of time to free Lady Slanda, find out where the gold was, tie up Scramble the butler, and force him to tell them the full story of how Spittleworth had fooled the country, including his own impersonation of Professor Fodersham and Widow Buttons. Boys, let's not be hasty, said Spittleworth faintly. There's a lot of gold here. I'll share it with you. It isn't yours to share, said Bert. You're coming back to, show, to Shoeville, and we're going to have a proper trial. All right, I hope you enjoyed today's reading. Bye-bye.